Hi guys, uh, welcome to, to the last ever um, episode of my Warhammer Conquest review series. We've got them to issue 80. It's been a ride. Got a lot of bump in this issue. <laughs> if you're interested in this, um, they sent a lot of them out apparently. Um, my local shop got more than it usually gets. Um, I think that's probably because they're trying to clear the clear the stock, um, which always happens. Um, it's really sad, but <laughs> let's get into it. Let's have a look at the plastic. Right, first off, we've got um, some more walkways, some more of the clips, and some more of the fencing, and this giant crab skull thing, which is cool. I think it's meant to be like a, a picking up claw. Um, it's got this on it, which is a hoist unit, which you see it at, um, in <clears throat> in some mechanics garages and weirdly enough, even in some um, disabled people's homes and elderly people's homes in yeah, much smaller versions. And they don't have a crab skull on them. Although, you know, some of the disabled people's homes, who knows? Um, again, a fantastic detail. <clears throat> looking really good and again the most impressive part ironically is the part you'll probably look at least which is the floor here <clears throat> we've got all these um, all these crisscross bits and then inside each of these holes it's been layered over a very complex network of piping and uh and tubes which you know i'd imagine that you know it was made in two layers you know, the piping and tubes and then the grid laid over it but it must have taken it must have taken whoever sculpted the original thing hours i mean this this probably took more time to sculpt than the Robert Gilliman Primark or something silly like that. Just because the amount of stuff that's in it. Um, but yeah, it looks really good. You've got fantastic detail. Here you have the um, feet. Now be aware, obviously, you can rearrange these in different patterns. Um, most people are going to want to glue it together um, for solidarity, yeah, for solidness. Um, and again, as I said in the previous things, it might be worth getting a thin bit of wood and basing it, um, or something else if you've got something else um, that's that's solid, just because the whole unit has a lot of these bits that hang down, and it's you know it is quite large. <clears throat> and whilst they are, as we can see, very thick, <clears throat> they are only held on by those little studs and <clears throat> that gluing surface there. So you've got a lot of, you can see that it's all the way down here. It's going to be glued all up there. That's a lot of leverage for something to be knocked and snapped. So for, so, yeah, for, for solidness, you're probably going to, going to want to base it. We've also got a lot of these bits here that are sticking underneath, just hanging cables. Got a fan there. And on the other side, we've got the little Mechanicus skull. Got the little Mechanicus skull there. Another one there. Another one there. Another one there. Uh, Two of them there, and another two on the other side. Lots of Mechanicum skulls. Two there, two there. Um, normal skull in there, because heaven forfend GW not give you your quota of skulls. <clears throat> so a little too ready today. <sighs> no skulls on the walkways that I can see. Obviously the actual huge skull there. And... Oh, another skull there. Another skull there. And another skull there. So we've got plenty of Mechanicum skulls. Um, <laughs> so I just noticed how many skulls on I thought I'd show. Oh no, and another, another Mechanicum skull there that I didn't see. Lots and lots and lots of Mechanicum skulls. So you definitely know this unit was made by the Adeptus Mechanicus. Um, just in case you were in any doubt of who made this unit, um, they spent hours of hours of um, of labour on behalf of you know <clears throat> on behalf of the serfs and the uh, the automata just carving in loads and loads of skulls. Um, <clears throat> it goes together to form a, a fantastic looking multi layered unit. Uh, as I said before, it's a great unit. Um, I've got some AOS guys just sitting on the table, so if I uh, there you can see the height of there. There you can see the height. There's the height of an AOS dude. So it's similar sight, similar height. It just happens to be what I've got on the table. 
Um, so you can see that you've got a lot of space there, which allows for you to get your hands in and move guys around. Um, the, the lower stuff's obviously more realistic. You know, you wouldn't build things to too big a height, but this is actually quite an easy unit to play in and around. Um, so that's pretty good as well. And obviously the, the height gives you a lot of really good fire lines. <coughs> um, but also again, leaves your units with an obvious sight of pretty much everyone on the field. So it, it balances out there as well. So that's really good. Right, let's get into the last issue. Ah, oh, Sisters of Battle. Yay. Um, obviously signed by Ian, our spiritual liege. And then on the first page, <coughs> Sisters of Battle, Armies of the Imperium. Um, the Sisters of Battle are one of my favourite ones. Um, A, because they look really cool and um, actually very original. And B, because they really under... You've got to remember, this is... Uh, GW been going since the 80s, so that's 40 years. And um, there was a lot more uh, <clears throat> just exclusively masculine casts back then. There were feminine casts. They they always had female guys there, but the majority of the people there were men. Well, the majority, not, the majority of the pe the models casted were men, not the people there. I have no idea what the gender balance of the actual, of the actual people in GW was at the time. <clears throat> I suspect it might have been mostly masculine, but... Let's not let's not cast judgments what we what I don't know. But the majority of the models were men and so to balance that out and they built in for some reason they built in the Space Marines couldn't be women, which was annoying when they did that because if you look at the original um uh Rogue Trader stuff, there were female Space Marines in it, which then later got wrecked onto women in power armour, which I kinda of thought was a bit daft, but you know, they did that. But um, later on, to counterbalance that, <coughs> uh, they brought out the Sisters of Battle. I think the idea was you've got armies that can have male and men and women in it, like the Eldar could be male and female, the Imperial Guard could be male and female, the Orcs were a fungus race, so they had no male or female. Um, <coughs> and so on and so forth. Um, but they did have one um, one battle faction that was exclusively male, which was the Space Marines, so to counterbalance that, they brought in a battle faction that was exclusively female, which was the Adeptus Sororitas. So, you know, it it, it, it kind of balances it out. It's a shame it needed balancing it out, but it is what it is. And it's nice to see women on the battlefield because you can have women on the battlefield. Um, in all fairness, a bullet makes just as much mess as a man of a man as it does a woman. And uh, whilst you can argue physical differences in strength and that, when most of your combat takes place with pulling triggers, there's not that much difference between my finger and a girl's finger and a lady's finger, a woman's finger, whatever, you know, that it would ever make a difference. <laughs> you know, even if you start sort of going, oh, well, realistically, blah, 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 blah. Realistically, there's no reason a woman can't fight in battle. So it's nice to see uh, women fighting in battles. It's nice to see um, them being maniacs and psychopaths as well. Um, I am married to a woman, so they are, you know, maniacs and psychopaths. <clears throat> but um, also, they're one of the cooler armies in the game. They're very religious, very faith-driven, and they um, <clears throat> they do a lot of bad arsery. They're based on some of the older... Uh, Judeo-Christian religions. There was a thing called a uh, flagrance, which you actually they they actually have versions of in uh, Age of Sigma, where um, pain was considered to bring you closer to God, so they would cause themselves pain and hurt themselves in order to be closer to God. Um, it also has the advantage of making you know, giving you know, enabling you to endure pain and handle pain. Um, I wouldn't recommend it um, because in certain cases all it does is just hurt you and doesn't give you any advantages. But um, the sisters of Baal do come from a sect that does believe, or so, you know, that does believe that through suffering you grow, which um, is mental. And again, don't do that at home, kiddos. Um, the advantage, the idea is that it gives you that advantage that you know if if you're constantly in pain, then the pain of battle will be nothing. 
Um, we now know that not to actually be true. Um, scientific studies have proven that, you know, if you endure a lot of pain, then yes, you can, it can increase your ability to take pain, but also it just means that a little bit more, more pain will take you to your breaking point. So it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily actually work, but it was very much a religious belief, particularly back in the dark ages and things like that. Um, and weirdly enough with Mother Teresa, you get all this stuff about, oh, Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa. She was a nasty piece of work. Uh, she believed pain brought you close to God. And so she would go in and she would take care of people. But at the same time, she go, no, no, they can't have painkillers. Oh, no, painkillers get between them and God. So, you know, Mother Teresa, not necessarily the saint we believe her to be. But anyway, it was mostly popular in the olden days, not so much now. Um, as you can see, they look really cool. They've got similar Space Marine backpacks. They've got similar Space Marine power armor. Um, in some cases, they use padded armor and that. But the power armor does enable them to wield big guns in the same way it enables the Space Marines to wield big guns. Um, I'll read you the blurb. It's like, uh, here we go. The Adeptus Serratus, known to most citizens as the Sisters of Battle, are warriors of the Ecclesiarchy. It is their duty to defend humanity and the Imperial faith. I love doing this stupid voice. They ensure that the word of the emperor reaches every corner of the Imperium. <clears throat> the basic background is there was an upright. The Ecclesiarchy are the religious side of the Imperium. They believe that the emperor is a god, even though he said not. And most and a lot of the space marines exist. Uh, who, uh, a lot of space marines insist that he isn't because that's in their dogma. <clears throat> but. Um, they put, you know, the Ecclesiastes push him as a god and insist that everybody worship the emperor as such. This has an advantage for the Imperium that um, a lot of the Imperial citizenry don't question the orders of the Empire because it is mandated from a god and gods are infallible. Um, it's used as a method of um, population control, which again is has been what it's been used for in a lot of other a lot of other scenarios uh, in history <clears throat> um but at some point there was a rising up of the ecclesiarchy because they thought well we're giving the word of the emperor these you know the council of terror just men we should be in charge obviously we represent we represent the god emperor which obviously they didn't because <clears throat> the god emperor himself didn't want to be known as a god Although he, from what I understand, he allowed it to happen once he was in the chair because he needed the Imperium to survive. Um, <clears throat> this um, <clears throat> basically civil war was backed up by the fact that the Ecclesiarchy had a lot of men under arms. They had a lot of Imperial Guard style troops. Um, some of the um, Space Marine chapters did believe the Emperor was God and, and even sided with them. Eventually it ended. Um, uh, the way it is quite interesting. Um, the head of the um, sist, the head of the um, it wasn't the sisters of battle. It was a, it was one of the female orders that supported the ecclesiarchy, um, who were a female order of warriors. They went. They were the head of that female order. Were invited in to see the emperor. Um, and they're allowed to speak to the emperor. And the head of that order then went out, went back to I think it was a guy called Sebastian Thor, who was the um, the heretic. And uh, cut his head off. She went. She went in. She said, "I've just done a word with the emperor." And he says, <laughs> and he says, "Shank," and that ended the uprising. And since then, the ecclesiarchy um, have been banned from having any men under arms. So supposedly, the sisters of Baal not being men under arms gets past this rule, and the um, Imperium and the High Lords of Terror are willing to allow that because the sisters of battle exist independently of the ecclesiarchy. Yeah, they will work for it and they will help it and they believe the Emperor is a god, but they're not directly bound to the um, the um, hierarchy of the Ecclesiarchy. So whilst the Ecclesiarchy can go, we're sending uh, missionaries, please send in Sisters of Battle. If the Ecclesiarchy steps out of line, the Sisters of Battle are allowed to go and kill them. Um, so it kind of, they, they form a protection for the Ecclesiarchy. They technically get round the, uh, you can't have men under arms things, but they are also the people that watch the Ecclesiarchy. They're like kind of almost the internal inquisitors for the Ecclesiarchy. They're the ones that sit there and go, eh, you are not uh, working for the good of the Imperium. And the, um, the Imperium was built by the Emperor, so we're going to kill you to keep both the Ecclesiarchy uh, strong and pure and the, em the, um, the Empire strong and pure and so on and so forth. So that's really cool. Um, 
<clears throat> He's got his other little blurb here. Title, Adept of Sororitas, otherwise known as the Sisters of Battle. Um, nuns with guns, bolter bitches, and so on. Um, <laughs> um, renowned orders, you've got the Order of the Martyred Lady, the Order of the Sacred Rose, and the Order of the uh, Eben Chalice. You know, great heroes. You've got Saint Celestine, who's a living Imperial Saint who we've met. And Junith Eru Eruta. Eruta. <clears throat> well, I haven't heard of her before, but she's cool. <clears throat> it goes through to cover <clears throat> some of the uh, <clears throat> gear of the Sisters of Battle. Um, so they look pretty cool. Um, Uh, we've got the Sorotus Power Armor. The power worn by the Sisters of Battle is based upon the same archaic system as worn by their Brethren of the Adeptus of Stratus. You can see there, there's a lot of padding. But some of that padding goes over the Power Armor. In some bits, it's instead of the Power Armor, but for the most part, they've got full-on Power Armor. Uh, Fleur de Lis tattoos. Many sisters bear devotional markings such as tattoos. Elec 2s, I don't know what the Elec 2 is, and Ritual Scars. <clears throat> purity Seals, Sisters wear Purity Seals to further protect from the taint of the impure. Godwin Diaz Pattern Bolter. The standard issue weapon for all Battle Sisters is the Godwin Diaz Pattern Bolter. Uh, has remained unchanged for millennia. <clears throat> it's a slightly smaller Bolter than the Adeptus uh, Stratus Carry. Uh, Stratus carry and it is, it's more similar to the bolters that you'll find on um, elite, uh, elite Imperial Guard units, obviously, because it's still the right scale of them. But um, it still fires the same bullets and does the same damage. Um, Chaplet Ecclesiasticus. Every member of the uh, Citadel wears a string of adamantine beads bearing one of the icons of the Ecclesiastes, so that's cool. So they're adamantine, so I'm assuming you can strangle people with them. And livery, the sister battle where the livery of the order. This uh, sister battle where the livery of the order of the martyred lady. <clears throat> and that's where that's where the padding and that come in. Um, yeah, the battle armor tends to be fairly solid and unadorned because, again, they're kind of based on the Christian the Christian idea uh, to a certain extent of purity. And to us, you know, they, they go both. It goes kind of both ways. There's there's some of them are very much. You know, you're very pure and don't have symbols. And in other cases, it's like, except for all these symbols, which are our symbols that don't count. And that is a thing that happened in religion as well. So that's a bit, that's again, GW drawing from um, the real world for inspiration. Um, here we can see the model of St. Celestine. <clears throat> We've got a sister with a bolt gun. And here, down here, you can see we have the units of um, Sisters of Baal. They've got jump troops and everything. They're still using those winged guys. Always, I was hoping with the new sister battle they'd um, actually move them to, to proper jump packs because I always thought, you know, you've got massive jump packs on these marines and then the sister battle you think would have to scale massive jump packs, but they've got these weird wing things. But again, that's kind of playing along with the angelic uh, stuff they're going for. Um, you've got the Exorcist tank, which is one of the sisters battle's few exclusive tanks. That does a lot of cool things and is basically a giant mobile organ of purity. Um, it's worth noting that you know the Sisters of Battle use a lot of um, uh, religious stuff. Um, they have sort of prayers, incantations, and things they can do on the battlefield, which works similarly, from what I understand, to the Imperial Guard orders. You know, they allow them to shoot more, run more, and fight more, and things like that. So that's pretty cool. Next, literally just the Sisters of Battle. Next one to the building the magma event walkway. They're giving a few pages to Sister Bell, which I think is really good because, like I say, they are one of the weirder and more different units. Um, different units, different armies, uh, which is one of the good things about them. They are kind of a very sort of... They, are, they, ha they draw from all the other armies, but they really do things their own ways, and they look different. Again, they're not just... Um, space marines with boobs in the same way that Chaos were space marines with spikes. They've very much got their own look, their own feel, their own way of fighting. And whilst obviously they've drawn influence from the Space Marines and they've drawn influence from the Imperial Guard and other similar things, they've managed to combine it in a way which is very unique. They're a really good army. Um, loads of fun to play. Um, I haven't played them myself, but everyone who plays them says they're a lot of fun to actually play. 
Um, they do the job they're supposed to and they're quite effective. <clears throat> um, I don't know how they work in 8th because I haven't discussed 8th um, with, with many of the Sister Battle players because the Sister Battle have only come back recently. Uh, most of the players I knew had old metal, metal armies that they pieced together. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> last week we had how to build the Magnavent walkway. This week we've got how to paint the Magnavent walkway. Here they're advising you to paint the entire thing silver. Then dry brush that. Then you go over it <coughs> with a Rakarth flesh. And you can see what's happening is the silver that's been washed and uh, dry brushed is staying there. The top surface, some of the surface is going Rakarth flesh. So that you're getting a different feel for some of the stuff. Um, Painting all the bits and pieces. <clears throat> Not much I can show you here, just the green itself. Using Necron compound and gold. And there you have. There you have your Magnavent walkway. Yeah, it looks like they've gone over it rack off flesh, but not entirely. <clears throat> to give it a kind of a lighter feel on the top and a darker feel underneath, which is really cool. Like I say, it's a fantastic. Fantastic piece of scenery, very good to play with. <clears throat> Next, you've got the Magnavent walkway. <clears throat> Where are you going to place it? So you're going to place it there on the map. Um, <clears throat> we've got some rules for it. Only infantry beast and swarm units that and units that can fly can be set up or in their move on the upper levels. Unless they can fly, these models must climb the ladders. So it is really important you consider where you put those ladders. Um, girders or walls to move up and down between levels. Um, infantry can move through the girders, buttresses and hanging chains without impediment. Infantry units that are entirely on or within the magnet walk over receive the benefit of cover. Other infantry units, you know, uh, other, I'll try again, other, inf other units on, yeah, that doesn't make sense, yeah, yeah, it says other units on receive the benefit at least 50%, if at least, I'll try that again, other units on receive this benefit, if at least 50% of every model is obscured from the point of view of the shooting model, other units on receive. I'm assuming it meant in Magnavent Walkway or on the Magnavent Walkway, but it just says on. It's the morning, I can barely speak as it is. It's got some um, bits there demonstrating how you can and can't use the, the walkway. Um... Oh, oh. Sorry, guys. Then we've got mission briefing. <coughs> Corvon 2 has suffered for many months. Millions have died. It's unfortunate we now have a Corvid virus going around and we're talking about Corvon 2. Um, oh well, <laughs> weird. Millions have died. The best efforts of the Ultramarines, each death has empowered... Despite the best efforts of the Ultramarines, each death has empowered the Death Guard unit warriors. I can't read this morning, guys. I'm sorry. I'm a bit tired. I had to get up early to help my missus out. Um, just getting a tattoo. Um, anyway, each death has empowered the Death Guard warriors... Weakening the barrier between reality and the warp. They now pursue their ultimate goal. To turn Corvon 2 into a demon world. Sounds like time for an exterminatus, guys. <clears throat> so we're just going here. Here we've got some beautiful images there of the, uh, the war for Corvon. <clears throat> oh, we've got this cool weird buttress thing, which is going in the middle. Oh, this is a top down view of one of those weird summoning circles. The Noct Noctilith Crown. Um, a colossal structure stands in the centre of the city. Carved from alien stone and rusted iron, it hums with power. Death Guard hold positions around it. Sorcerers chanting foul hymns. So you place the Noctilith uh, Crown. After you let the battle mats, remove the page with the Noctilith Crown and place it at the centre. The Noctilith Crown will serve as the objective in this mission. 
see over the page for full details. <clears throat> so you set up lengthways as usual and in a very specific way. <clears throat> With the crown in the middle, uh, you get Space Marines, a new Space Marine stratagem. In this mission, space, the Space Marine player can spend a command, can spend command points to use the following stratagem for three command points. Um, this strategy can be used once per battle at the end of your movement phase. Pick a unit from your army with a power rating of nine or less that has been destroyed during the battle. You can set that unit up wholly within six inches of any battlefield edge and more than nine inches away from enemy models. So uh, you get a unit of nine points or less back. Um, and the Death Guard get for two uh, command points dug in defences. Use this stratagem after setting up one of your units until that unit moves for any reason. You can add one to that unit's saving throw against all shooting attacks. So add that to some guys in cover and you've got some... And you've got some badassness going on. The armies are selected from Death Guard miniatures or Space Marine miniatures. Maximum power rating of 60. Death Guard get three command points. Space Marine get three command points. <clears throat> Space Marine deploying each end. Death Guard deploying in the middle with the um, Knock Tilith Crown. <clears throat> As a centre point. It's worth noting if you want to replay these games later, the Knock of Crown and along a lot of all the other scenery that we haven't yet got is available from GW. So there are bits of scenery there that we that we did get and there are bits that we don't get. Uh, the Death Guard player sets up their units within the deployment zone. The Space Marine then sets up the units within their deployment zones. Space Marine, player, Space Marine player takes first turn. Victory conditions at the end add up the power ratings of all the Space Marine player units that are in six of the warp portal, the Noxalith Crown, and all the Death Guard players that are within six of the warp portal, the player with the higher result wins. If the score is tied, the defender, which is the Death Guard, wins. The game lasts for six round rounds, and we've got Space Marine victories. <clears throat> um, the planet planets corrupted beyond hope of saving are often targeted with the Exterminatus. Told you. <clears throat> this is always the last resort, as the Imperium cannot afford to sacrifice resources. Doing so is far better than wishing the spread of corruption, however. Um, so if you win, it's a hollow victory, but you wipe out the world. Um... Death Guard. With the Space Marines defeated, the Death Guard and, the de and their demon allies are free to spread their influence across the planet, warping it into an infected demon world. So it's so possessed by demons that it's literally um, infected and touches the warp. Um, there are very few demon worlds outside of space. Uh, most of the demon worlds you get are in are along the um, Great Rift. Um, I don't know where this one is. I think it is actually along the Great Rift. But this world is now a demon world. <clears throat> Lord Feltheus laughs heartily to himself <clears throat> as a tide of demons manifest at his summons. The corpse of the Ultramarines lay broken in the dirt and their warships had fled orbit. Corvon II belongs to the Death Guard. He would, and he would turn it into a paradise worthy of the plague god himself. I didn't read the... Read, yeah. <clears throat> read the Space Marine blow. Let's read the Space Marine blow. The last of the explosive charges on the Nocolith Crown detonate, sending a shockwave bursting out through the war-torn streets of Alastrandra. Alastrandra, yeah. Warriors are tossed aside as the remaining buildings collapse and a mushroom cloud erupts into the filth-thick skies of Corvon too. I like mushrooms. <sighs> so they blow that crap up and then they blow that crap up again. Uh, on the last page, no more next week's. Nothing's coming next week. It is over. Cry, cry. But it's got a picture of a Warhammer shot. Please comment if you know which one that is. Um, <clears throat> Warhammer 40k Conquest is your first steps into a new hobby, but your journey has only just begun after 80 issues. I think after 80 issues, you're fairly solidly along. Um, immerse yourself in the worlds of Warhammer by visiting your local gaming store and checking out a full range of products. Um, it goes on to talk about Warhammer stores and how amazing they are. 
It also goes on to say with over 2,000 independent stockists around the globe carrying a range of Warhammer products or local stories never too far away. I love my local Warhammer store. I love my local independent stockists better. You get a far better range of things and you can often get things a lot cheaper. GW produces great quality stuff, but it also it also is quite expensive. One of the reasons you may have been collecting this is because it reduced the price of collecting um of collecting 40k army. Most uh, independent stockists tend to be a little bit cheaper. My local one is 5% cheaper. Some of the others are 10, even 15% cheaper. Uh, some are the same price. Um, you just got to look at your local stockists. But even if the models themselves are the same price, they've usually got things like um, cheaper brushes and cheaper paint and things like that. All of which help reduce the cost and it's worth noting a lot of the paints available um including the army painter ones and the vallejo ones are of approximate quality to gw i think gw uh, personally i always find uh, army painter to be as good as gw but the general opinion is that gw are a little better a little better than army painter and the general opinion is that vallejo are the best and are better than gw <clears throat> that's not to dish gw paints gw paints are fantastic um, a lot of the colours are grey, and you'll see that in each paint range has its own unique colours. Um, you know, you've got Retributor Armour there, which is a nice dark gold from GW, and you've got Bright Gold there, which is a nice light gold from um, Army Painter. But as long as you're using acrylics, um, they'll usually go together. Um, so it really comes down to your personal preference. Um, There are a lot of other models that you can use in GW games, although they won't let you use them in official GW tournaments or in the GW shop. And there are a lot of other awesome systems out there that you might want to try. Um, Corvus Belli's Infinity is, to my mind, one of the better systems. Um, Manifo has some of the best models. Uh, Property Press's War Machine has a slightly um, is it has a slightly quicker rule system than the GW stuff, although I prefer the GW rule system myself. Um, if you're into historic stuff, um, uh, Bolt Action um, is a fantastic uh, historic game, and the models there um, are less detailed because, in all fairness, the GW stuff is more detailed than a lot of people would be in real life, but they're, they're American soldiers, German soldiers, Russian soldiers are all very high detail, um, very realistic looking and you can buy dozens of them for the price of a single GW model so there, there is a ton of stuff out there um, go into your local stockist, stockist look at it uh, another reason I always encourage local stockists is because um, a decade or two ago GW got to the point where they were pretty much the only game people were playing um, and whilst they were in that uh, top spot for a long time the quality of their models the quality of their rules really slipped uh, a lot of independent, a lot of independent games then came up, and frankly, not only were those, not only were those games better than what GW was doing at the time, in my opinion, but they had the effect of co of costing GW a big chunk of their market share, which then caused GW to react by really starting to look at their gaming system, invest their gaming system, find out what people wanted, find out what people enjoyed, and um, they've really turned it around to the point where again. They're one of the best gaming companies in the world um, and the quality of their product is top tier again. Whereas it, it literally, for a period of time, it wasn't. Um, the rules weren't as fun as they could have been. The models were quite expensive. They're still expensive, but you, you didn't get that much use out of them. Um, some armies hadn't received updates for years. Um, looking at the Dark Angels players, uh, as a Space Wolf player, I always got the love, but we had the Space Wolf, um, the Space Wolf had, I think, three new codexes in a time, you know, between two Dark Angel codexes, um, and that doesn't happen anymore, so we live in a capitalist free market system, as much as we might want to make it a bit more humane and socialist, I'm a massive socialist, apologies, um, we live in a capitalist system, and if you want to live in a capitalist system, you have to play the game. You know, if you just if you're just loyal to one company, you get nothing. You know, you have to look at it. You have to go. You know what? This company is providing a better product at a cheaper price. I'm going to go for this company. 
um, because if nothing else, it should force the other companies to try and keep up. And in, in GW's case, this was particularly something that didn't happen for a while. You could see that it wasn't working. And then when GW, then when other companies were able to exploit that and basically get a chunk of market share, it's it not only made the whole, it not only made it better for people who bought from them, it made it better for everybody, including people who bought from GW, because it forced GW to up their game and maintain high quality games because they were suddenly in competition where they hadn't been for a while. So that's my little sort of capitalist independent stock is ran there. But you know, I always think that your local GW is amazing, can't fault them, but your local independent stores are better. And if you just invest in one company to the dead, to the, f uh, the failing of all others, it doesn't work. That company can get, that company then no longer has to fight and provide good product they can provide whatever they want and there's not much you can do about it um you know which can cause companies to become less good it's an unfortunate fact right so there you go but <clears throat> except the portion of cw the portion of cw is amazing um ian's amazing that's a complete exception always go to that one um and always go to fiscal ice in portsmouth as well you know, always go only, always go exclusively just to those two stores never go to the other store just to those two stores or Waterloo models they're amazing go to that store as well um, <laughs> or Fratton models they're fantastic matter of fact if you're in Portsmouth you're spoiled for fucking choice there are like four or five model shops out South Sea models that's another one that's great um, and they're all really good um, they've all got their own advantages um, I really like Waterloo models because it has a lot of the weirder tools which I like to get hold of. Um, uh, I like uh, GW Portsmouth because I've been going there since a kid, since I was a kid, and the staff there are friendly and great, but not too pushy. Um, <clears throat> uh, Southsea Models has been going for years, and it has some really weird bits in it that you can't find anywhere else because it's had them for years. A little pricey, but still great place. <laughs> and of course, Fistful of Dice is my perfect modeling shop, which I love above all modeling shops. Um, because I helped set it up and it's uh, it's done exactly the way that I would do it because I did it. Um, oh, not to forget Dice, who are the gaming cafe in Portsmouth. They're amazing too. Um, they they sell, they don't sell GW stuff, but they do sell board games and you can go in there and book tables and game and eat, which is fantastic. I want to see more of those gaming cafes or lounges, I think it's called, around. They've got a lot of space. Um... Yeah, Portsmouth's amazing. If you're a gamer, you are really sport for choice in this city. Um, <laughs> if you're not um, sport for choice in other cities, if I can build a game shop with my mates, you can too. Uh, it's not hard to do, you know, even if you know, in America, in Britain, in Can Canada, I was about to say Canada, in other places, there are a lot of government um, grants and loans and that which have great interest, have nice low interest rates to help your businesses started, um, talk to business stop places elsewhere. Um, when we were setting up, we went to store, we went to Cardiff and spoke to um, Firestorm uh, Games. The guy there was really helpful and really nice. If you're in Cardiff, do go to Firestorm Games. It is fucking amazing. They're basically an air hanger full of gaming space now. It's brilliant. Um, yeah, but go talk to, go talk to other gaming shops in similar areas. It isn't actually that hard to set up an independent stockist. Um, keeping it going, getting sleep and having a family simultaneously can be hard. But, you know, I'm always a great believer if you, if someone's not doing what you want, do it yourself. <clears throat> um, even if it doesn't work, you'll have a rewarding experience and you'll know you did your best. Um, so yeah, um, I think I'm just trying to extend this video now because it's the last one for Conquest. Um, oh, yes, that was it. There won't be any more videos, but there is at least one, there is at least one more prize draw. Um, I PM'd people um, for these models. They did not get back to me. Um, I did not get emails from them. Uh, so if you emailed me and the email didn't get through, this is your last chance to email me because these three models, which is the um, Tally Man, um, 
the um, the surgeon, uh, the noble plague surgeon, and the death guard champion, I have still got. Um, if your emails have bounced, I apologise. Try and get contact with me with other in other ways. If you get to me before I do the prize draw, which I'm going to do next week, and then I might do a little video to announce it. I might just poke people in the comments. Poke, um, but I'm going to select three separate guys from the comments on this video to get one of these each. Um, I say I'm going to select three separate guys. I'm going to roll the dice three times and exclude anybody that's already won. So yeah, three separate guys, and I will send you whoever wins these models, unless somebody who's already won one of these models and some, oh, boo, I still didn't get that model or I didn't get through, contacts me in the meantime, at which point, obviously, they'll get the models. But, you know, there's a chance to win three more models. If you enjoyed my Conquest series, uh, please consider watching my Mortal Realms series. Um, Mortal Realms is set in the Age of Sigma universe. If you're not familiar with it, it is a reworking of the... Um, a Warhammer Fantasy Universe, which was the first of the Warhammer universes, very much it was the Fantasy Universe was very much based on Tolkien. They've made this very much different, um, mostly because they weren't selling fantasy. Um, Warhammer Fantasy at one point was 50% of their sales and like 50 no, 50% 50 of their models and 15% of their sales. So they had to redo it, and AOS has been very successful in that for them. Which again, it's always a bit sad when you lose your favorite game, but if you don't support the game it goes away um so yeah in reference to my previous one there's always a balance you've got to support stuff you've got to you know you've got to consider competition blind loyalty gets you nowhere you know gets you nowhere into, with businesses um not supporting them and not having loyalty also gets you nowhere you've got to strike the balance <clears throat> but the uh <clears throat> the age of sigma game is a great game there is nurgle in it there is an empire if you're a if you're a fan of the Space Marines, the um, as you can see from the model I'm half if you're painting, there is a lot of parallel between the Space Marines and the um, Stormcast Eternals. Um, there are different stories in that. There's a lot of stuff affecting the Chaos Gods and that, um, who are the same Chaos Gods. Um, there's Lords of Death. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, so please consider watching that. Um, you might like it, you might not. Um, <clears throat> I will continue to do other videos sporadically when I get the opportunity. Unfortunately, um, as the title of the channel suggests, well, I'm, a dad, I'm a dad with three kids so and a wife who's actually mentally ill. So often that takes priority, which is why it takes me so long to make models. Um, but yeah, uh, if you've been following from the beginning or if you've even just tuned in for this episode, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed the series. And... Uh, if you're not continuing on the journey with me with other things, thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you around sometime. Bye bye. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed that video and if you did, remember to like and subscribe to my channel. I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. I'm not sure why, but I am. Um, so if you like it, see me there and uh, please tell your friends. Thanks very much. Bye.